Censorship and propaganda were the norm during World War II. Similar to America with its Hays Code, filmmakers in wartime Japan had to go through their government's information bureau if they ever hoped of getting a film made. Directors like Akira Kurosawa strained under the narrow guidelines of the censors, who might infer sexual impropriety in a pair of factory doors or an unwholesome Western influence in a kiss on the staircase. After losing the war, however, occupation by Allied forces in Japan, lasting from 1945 until 1952, ushered in a stark reversal on what stories were allowed or encouraged on film. The Japanese form of censorship was ended while a new, more Western flavor was installed. The three organizations established by the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers tasked with upholding press censorship were the Civil Communications Section, the Civil Censorship Detachment, and the Civil Information and Education Section. The CCS focused on monitoring what was being broadcast to the Japanese people, while the CCD monitored printed and filmed works to ensure that no form of media was spreading messages against democracy. The CIC was used primarily to educate Japanese publishers and producers on how to integrate pro-democratic values into their publications to boost support for the new government. While filmmakers like Kurosawa welcomed the change, others encountered new and unexpected difficulties when trying to tell authentic stories of a post-war Japan. One notable example of this new form of censorship was encountered in the making of the film Late Spring by director Yasuhiro Ozu. In the original synopsis, a scene where the main character Noriko goes to visit her mother's grave was apparently removed by occupation censors because it might be interpreted as something called ancestor worship. References to the Allied bombing of Tokyo were also removed, as was mention of American film star Gary Cooper, until censors realized it was a favorable one. Despite the imposition, Ozu still managed to sneak past a certain cynicism at the westernization of Japan. In one scene, Noriko and her father's assistant ride past a monstrously large Coca-Cola sign in the foreground, an obvious blemish against an otherwise picturesque stretch of countryside. If one of the recurring themes of Ozu's films is a sort of compromise between the generations, just as often he depicts the westernization of Japan as something gaudy and adolescent. Meanwhile, probably the most damaging act of censorship by occupation forces was forbidding any mention of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. U.S. officials controlled information about radiation from the bombs by censoring newspapers, by silencing outspoken individuals, by limiting circulation of the earliest official medical reports, by fomenting deliberately reassuring publicity campaigns, and by outright lies and denial. While American scientists had always known about the radioactive side effects of the bomb, they allegedly had no idea how devastating or far-reaching they would soon turn out to be. In the days immediately following the bombings, people began filling the hospitals in Japan, suffering from a mysterious illness. A person's hair would fall out. They would break out in purple spots all over their body and they would suffer through intense nausea, vomiting, headaches, and fever. The one thing the afflicted all had in common was that they'd survived or been near where the bombs had been dropped. Censorship of the Japanese began quickly. As soon as Japanese physicians and scientists reached Hiroshima after the bombing, they collected evidence and studied the mysterious symptoms in the ill and the dying. American officials confiscated Japanese reports, medical case notes, biopsy slides, medical photographs, and films, and sent them to the United States, where much of it remained classified for years, some for decades. This level of information control very likely not only cost people their lives, but also helped contribute to the discrimination of those affected by the bomb, known in Japan as hibakusha. The average person knew very little about the after-effects of atomic radiation. There was no telling whether what had happened to the hibakusha might be hereditary or contagious, and so they were often discriminated against in prospects of work or marriage. If the reason for censorship of the after-effects of the bomb was to somehow quell public anxiety, it just as likely had the opposite effect. The first film that attempted to shed light on the bombings came in 1950, called The Bells of Nagasaki, but was heavily censored upon release and seems to have since been lost to time. It wasn't until 1952, after Allied occupation was ended, that films about the war and the atomic bomb were finally able to be told without foreign interference. Even then, these first few films weren't completely without political incentive. 
1952, Children of Hiroshima, directed by Kaneto Shindo, who was himself a native of Hiroshima, was commissioned by the Japanese Teachers Union. The story follows a kindergarten teacher, played by Nobuko Atawa, Shindo's wife and frequent collaborator, as she returns to her hometown of Hiroshima to visit the graves of her parents and younger sister, who were killed in the bombing. Along the way, she encounters a family friend now living in seclusion as a hibakusha, another who's been made infertile by the bomb's radiation, as well as former students now dead or dying from radiation sickness. While the film has been accused of being overly sentimental, its depiction of the bombing remains effective for a certain surreal horror movie quality, a tone that Shindo would become better known for with later films like Oni Baba and Koroneko. While the film was a success with Japanese audiences, it was criticized by the Japanese Teachers Union for a lack of any forceful social or political message. As a result, the Teachers Union then commissioned another film, released in 1953, called Hiroshima, from director Hideo Saikagawa. Comparing the two, while Hiroshima is the more overtly political, with characters questioning both American justification for the bomb, but also Japan's own militarism, what really sets this one apart is just how relentless it is in depicting the bomb and its immediate aftermath. In one scene, a group of schoolgirls and their teacher huddle together in a river, assumably to try and get some respite from the ash and the heat, only to one by one drop away like tree leaves in autumn. In another, a group of boys trapped under a heap of rubble take stock of which of them survived by calling out their names, taking roll call like they would in class every morning, and in doing, adding another layer of the real and the personal. Thousands of extras from Hiroshima, many of them survivors of the bomb themselves, lend a sense of authenticity in recreating a hellish nightmare world where charred and battered bodies dot the landscape, where black rain falls as thick as oil, and where the sick and the dying are barely indistinguishable from the already dead. That's the uniquely malevolent thing about the atomic bomb, is that it inflicts first an immediate and then a slow, creeping devastation. It's the bomb whose reach you can't altogether escape. You can leave behind the rubble, but you can't leave whatever awful disease the bomb might have started in your body. A terror like that might be hard to depict on film, or else might test the resolve of an audience that's already experienced firsthand so much death and disease. Maybe it's no surprise then that probably the most well-known film to deal with atomic disaster abstracts the bomb into a giant fire-breathing dinosaur. From 1954, directed by Ashiro Honda, comes Godzilla. Godzilla has undergone a number of radical changes over the years, from grim allegory for nuclear devastation to unwitting anti-hero to cute and cuddly goofball, back and forth between one or the other depending on the whims of the studio. Whatever Godzilla might have become since his inception, director Honda had the atomic bomb well in mind when first creating the now international sensation. If Godzilla had been a dinosaur or some other animal, he would have been killed by just one cannonball. But if he were equal to an atomic bomb, we wouldn't know what to do. So I took the characteristics of an atomic bomb and applied them to Godzilla. Terrified civilians are vaporized in a sudden white-hot flash of Godzilla's fire breath. Tokyo burns and is laid to rubble while the hospitals fill up with the burned and the maimed and the deathly radioactive. The fact that the movie was shot in black and white lends everything a certain newsreel quality. The deep shadows and the dark atmosphere go a long way to negate much of the innate goofiness of a man stomping about in a rubber suit. Watching children of Hiroshima, then Hiroshima, then Godzilla, one after another, you really get a sense of how much imagery they have in common. As a side note, each movie also has the same composer in Akira Ifukube, who reuses the exact same melancholy theme across all three films. Lazy? Sure, but it also lends a deeper sense of continuity between Godzilla and his real-world atomic origins. Throughout the film, people react to Godzilla's destruction with a sense of having been there before. Where most monster movies might play into a fear of the unknown, Godzilla brings with him a sense of atomic certainty, of knowing what's coming. The effectiveness of Godzilla is that we're watching a repeated trauma. The bomb, its aftermath, and all its attendant anxieties are suddenly given shape and form, gargantuan, unstoppable, unable to be steered off course. Godzilla as an allegory might represent any number of things. He's the natural world come to take revenge for the environmental ravages of atomic testing. He's the atom bomb off the leash, unbeholden to any country or government, the living embodiment of mutually assured destruction. 
At the same time, he's also the direct result of American short-sightedness, a foreign menace, an avatar of post-war cultural imposition. There's, I think, a certain patriotic streak in Godzilla, as it's a Japanese scientist who defeats the monster with his oxygen destroyer, but who then makes the ultimate sacrifice to ensure the device never falls into the wrong hands. Meanwhile, America's real-world atomic misdeeds against the Japanese, and their influence on Japanese film, didn't end with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when on March 1st, 1954, just a few months before the filming of Godzilla began, the Japanese fishing vessel Lucky Dragon No. 5 was showered with radioactive fallout from the U.S. military's 15-megaton Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb test at nearby Bikini Atoll. The boat's catch was contaminated, causing a panic in Japan with people wondering whether or not they might have eaten radioactive fish. The boat's crew was poisoned, with one member eventually dying from radiation sickness. The opening scene in Godzilla, of the beast destroying a Japanese vessel, was meant as a direct reference to the Lucky Dragon No. 5 and had a strong impact on Japanese viewers. In 1959, Kaneto Shindo, the director of Children of Hiroshima, made a film based on this story as well, but like so many of the films previously mentioned, seems to be out of print or hard to find. Continuing with the theme of less-than-ideal cultural exchanges between America and Japan, we arrive at Godzilla, King of the Monsters, the 1956 Americanized version of the 1954 original. For this version, all new scenes with Raymond Burr were added, playing a news reporter covering Godzilla's rampage through Tokyo. He's an amicable, if slightly awkward, presence, tall, portly, in a bulky tweed suit and never without his tobacco pipe. He spends a lot of the film acting opposite very obvious stand-ins for the original cast, each with a sudden perfect grasp of American English. While sure, this version does remove a lot of the original's nuclear context, and while Raymond Burr's insertion into the film is often less than seamless, King of the Monsters isn't the worst thing in the world. The story is largely still intact, the story is still focused on the original Japanese cast with Raymond Burr as more of an outside observer. Ironically, this American version was then released theatrically in Japan in 1957 as Kaiju o Gajira, which translates to Monster King Godzilla, to a positive reception from Japanese audiences, with the English dialogue subtitled in Japanese. Probably this version's worst offense is that it's more of a typical Atomic Age B-movie, and has kind of cemented the franchise as such, as this was the only version of the movie officially available outside of Japan until 2004. Really though, I think I've seen worse American meddling in an international film than King of the Monsters. I guess in some sense it was only fair, as Godzilla was heavily inspired by the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which is an American film that's also about a giant dinosaur awakened from its ancient slumber by atomic testing. While Godzilla was making waves in his home country and abroad, Akira Kurosawa made his statement on the atomic bomb with 1955's I Live in Fear, starring Toshiro Mifune. Mifune plays Kichi Nakajima, an old man whose anxieties about the bomb have him making plans to move his entire family to Brazil to try and avoid another potential nuclear disaster. His family, meanwhile, comprised of not just his wife and children, but also his mistresses and their children, they want nothing to do with Brazil, to the point where they take Nakajima to court to try and have him declared incompetent and thereby protect their inheritance. I Live in Fear takes a hard look at the lingering psychological toll of the bomb, at a man whose anxieties, however dramatic they might seem, weren't that much different from those of the rest of the country at the time. Maybe Nakajima really is too afraid, or maybe everyone else isn't afraid enough. The movie remains especially relevant today, when even as the horrors of nuclear war have faded from popular consciousness, it seems there's always something new to be afraid of, or that we're told to be afraid of. Even so, the movie's effectiveness isn't just in the broad or the allegorical, but how well it's articulated into something personal. Nakajima's eventual descent into madness might be just as much the fault of his often callous and opportunistic family as it is the atomic bomb. Looking at both Godzilla and I Live in Fear, it's interesting to see the two vastly different approaches to dealing with the bomb coming from the same studio at about the same time. 
Both the beginning and the end of I Live in Fear feature music unlike any Kurosawa has used before, with a pronounced use of theremin, which, when taken with the ending where a mad Nakajima claims to be on another planet, it's maybe meant as a sort of nod to the American science fiction films of the early 1950s, but also to his friend Ashiro Honda. As World War II gave way to the Cold War, anxieties about the atomic bomb made their way to the United States and inspired a slew of other films about giant monsters created by science run amok. Them in 1954, Tarantula in 1955, Earth vs. the Giant Spider in 1958. Lots of bugs for some reason. If Godzilla abstracted the atomic bomb into escapist kaiju fantasy, the B-movie sci-fi trends of the 50s and beyond took it even further. The effects of radiation were made outlandish and improbable. Giant spiders, that's silly. Your hometown getting nuked, that's silly. Besides, what do you do to a giant spider? You squish it, that's all. You can squish a bug, even a giant one. There's nothing science can break that it can't fix. Images like those in Children of Hiroshima, which barely ever penetrated the American consciousness in the first place, were supplanted by images of giant rubber ants. It's interesting that there are so many movies praised for their unflinching look at slavery or the Holocaust or the displacement of Native Americans, while the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki seem to lack that same sort of moral introspection in popular culture. Does Japan's allying themselves with Nazi Germany forbid any sympathy for their civilian population? Was World War II so much the good war that the ends justify the means? Is it because American geopolitical power is so tied to its nuclear arsenal? The reasons given for dropping the bombs are that they were necessary, that an already desperate Japan might have carried on the war until the last man if we hadn't. That might very well be the case, but it also seems like the debate has barely been had, least of all on American film. Then again, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe broad Hollywood appeals to emotion aren't the best methods of interpreting history. Maybe it's better left to the people who are actually there.